In today's lecture, we'll be talking about the uh, AC circuit analysis. So last week, we have uh, seen how to solve a circuit in general. It didn't matter if it's uh, an AC circuit or if it's a DC circuit. The methods are the same. And uh, today we'll focus in more detail about uh, how to analyze an AC circuit. Before we do that, let me talk a little bit about complex numbers. I know that uh, you should be aware of this from mathematics, but it is my experience, especially from the exams, that the students do not have the problems in terms of electrical circuit, but they have a huge problem with equations with complex numbers. So this will be a brief repeat repetition of uh, how to work with complex numbers and uh, how can we write them. And we will use this uh, quite often in AC circuit analysis. So first of all, let's take a look on the forms, how we can write the complex number. We can use an algebraic or also called a component form of the complex number. So our complex number is that has some real component A and uh, some imaginary component B. Now note that here I still kept the imaginary symbol I that you know from mathematics. But in the other equations uh, I have replaced the I here with J. The reason is that in electronics we we note currents with the letter I. So uh, we, can, we cannot have two I's in our equation. So in electronics, the complex unit is denoted as J. And I is current. The algebraic form is uh, very simple. You have the real component, you have the imaginary part. If you plot this uh, A and B in the complex plane then it would look somehow like this maybe I'll, I should uh, I should plot it here so uh, we'll have the real axis we'll have the imaginary axis there and uh, if uh, I have a complex number that's here then this would be A and uh, this would be B uh, we can write the complex number also in a polar form. So uh, for this we need the magnitude of my number, Z magnitude here, which will be this, this will be Z magnitude, and uh, we need the angle, so the angle here will be this, phi. So here you can see, okay, magnitude times cosine phi plus J times sine phi. Uh, and the last form is uh, similar to this one. It's called the exponential form. And you can see, okay, now this is the magnitude. And by using the Euler formula, which is here, we can rewrite this part of my equation, this uh, cosine and sine part, and this will be this e to the power of j phi. So in our calculations, uh, we will be using all of them. Uh, in uh, some cases we will prefer this one, in some cases we prefer the exponential form. Now why is it useful to uh, know both and to know how to use both? Well, there are operations uh, where it's uh, easier to perform the calculation if you have the algebraic component. And then there are calculations where it is easier to, per to make the result if you have the exponential form. For example, if you are adding two numbers or subtracting two numbers, uh, what you're doing is that you add the real parts and then you add the, the imaginary parts. So for addition and subtraction, the algebraic form is the easiest to work with. On the other hand, if you're doing uh, division or, or multiplication, then it's easier to work with the exponential form. So for example, imagine if you have um, 
z1 divided by z2 then in the algebraic form it, it is possible but it's more difficult than uh, if you just look here you divide the magnitudes and then you subtract the phases the phase the same if you are doing multiplication and uh, you multiply the magnitudes and you add the uh, the phases uh, this absolute value it's actually should go here uh, the the text should be there and uh, this is uh, to show you or to, to remind you how to calculate the magnitude of uh, a complex number so you should be sure to know this uh, for AC circuit analysis so if you have trouble with complex numbers repeat uh, some tutorials uh, from mathematics now we need to define a phaser what is a phaser because we will use the term phaser uh, a lot in our calculations now a phaser is described as a rotating vector so what you see here on the right side this is the time domain so here we have time and here we see our for example voltage and uh, in the time domain we can describe that the a the amplitude is a function of time and that's equal to the magnitude am times sine i omega t plus phi phi is the initial phase shift in this case in this picture it is zero because it begins here at the origin and omega is the angular frequency of my signal now uh, the method that we will learn for AC circuit analysis is not working with uh, time domain functions like this simply because we would have to solve uh, functions where we have sines and cosines but uh, the point of all this method is that we can get rid of the sines and cosines and we can work with these equations as with algebraic equations so the trick is that we transform this time domain signal into the complex domain which you see here on the left so let's imagine this point here let's freeze the time and uh, let's say now we are at this time point so we can see that here we have the angle of 30 degrees and this is my magnitude of my signal uh, <coughs> you can see that uh, the magnitude here is uh, always the same am that's the magnitude and that's that's a constant number so what I'm what I'm doing is that this phaser rotates in time rotates like this and for example if I would be here at 90 degrees it would have exactly the same magnitude but only a different phase shift so a phaser is a rotating vector that is rotating like that counterclockwise in uh, the complex domain and we can say that this would be our real axis like that and uh, this would be our imaginary axis the transition from the time domain into the complex domain will simplify quite a lot our equations in the sense that we will not use this but our equations will be algebraic equations uh, what is happening with the angle if we work uh, in the complex domain now uh, if you multiply some vector with plus j then it means that you are rotating that by one, uh, 190 degrees so if initially for example my vector my phaser was like that I multiply that by plus j then it means it gets rotated by 90 degrees so uh, the uh, magnitude is not changing what is changing is this angle 
and uh, you can know that here I have a defined positive direction like that it's defined as uh, counterclockwise so plus J means 90 degrees in uh, the positive direction so this is plus and this would be minus if I would multiply that by minus J then I would do this this would be this vector this phasor and uh, it's either if you can say okay it's 270 so it's this or it's also this which is minus 90 degrees and here you can see the, the different uh, powers of, of J and so on okay so uh, now uh, let's define the condition when this method that we are going to discuss will work there are four conditions the method will work only in steady state and by steady state here we do not mean constant uh, values but uh, we understand this as an AC steady state so uh, we have the same frequency of our signals uh, we don't have any transients in the circuit this will be some limitation because uh, we cannot for example calculate the circuit uh, in a transient response when we turn it on to AC voltage in all cases we need to wait until this transient fades which uh, depends on the circuit parameters but uh, then it's gonna work if we would like to calculate AC circuits in uh, transient mode we would need to solve a set of uh, differential equations which is quite complicated so uh, here this method <coughs> has this limitation but it gives us algebraic equations the second condition is that all voltages and all current sources are sinusoidal so we cannot use this method if we are working with rectangular signal like that it's not gonna work again we would need to write differential equations or at the very least uh, we would need to make a Fourier transform of this split that into different frequencies and then calculate for all of them and then sum it back again and use uh, inverse Fourier transform. The third condition is that uh, all frequencies of all voltage and current sources in the circuit are the same. So this means that uh, we can have only a single frequency in our circuit. It will not work if uh, you have two power supplies with the different frequencies. And the third condition, the third limitation, is that all our components, such as resistors, inductors, and capacitors, are linear. Especially in the case of uh, AC circuits in, uh, in electrical machines, uh, you <coughs> will see that this might be a limitation, because, uh, for example, the inductors may be saturated and uh, their inductance will be also a function of current but uh, again if we would like to solve this with uh, non-linear components uh, we would need to use differential equations so it means that all our components will be linear they will not change its properties with voltage or current so let's see how this uh, method is working. Now we will have uh, two specialized lab classes where we will do the calculations and we'll do the simulations. Uh, today I'd like to show you how to describe the circuit and how to solve the whatever we want to calculate. So let's take a look on the circuit that we see here it's uh, powered with uh, voltage V1 it has uh, two inductors L1 and L2 and uh, two resistors R1 and R2 
and uh, we know what is the voltage, we know what is the frequency, and uh, we would like to calculate what is the voltage here between those two terminals, uh, V, A and B. So now what I will do is that I will just copy this uh, picture and uh, copy that uh, to uh, an app where I can actually write on top of it. Uh, so this is our circuit that we would like to analyze. <clears throat> now we, from circuit analysis we know two methods, node method and mesh method. So first of all, let's uh, explore how many equations do we actually need for this circuit. <clears throat> so I'll start with the node method. Uh, the number of equations, xu, is given by the number of nodes. We see we have one, two, three, four nodes in my circuit, so it's four minus the number of voltage sources, which we have one voltage source v1 so minus one uh, minus one because we need uh, one node as a reference and uh, therefore this gives us two equations for the mesh method let's call that xi uh, we need uh, the number of components so we have one two three four and the fifth is the power supply, so we have five components, minus the <coughs> number of nodes, which is four, uh, minus the number of current sources, which is zero, plus one. So this gives us also two equations. So it doesn't matter what method do we use for our population, uh, for this particular circuit, uh, the better approach would be to use uh, the mesh method. And you'll see why. Well, it doesn't really matter. In, in both cases, you need two equations. So uh, I will uh, show you both. And uh, I will start uh, with the mesh method. So for the mesh method, uh, we need to uh, define our meshes. So I will define my mesh, uh, well, well, just uh, erase this one as well. I will uh, define my mesh <coughs> like this. One will be this one. And uh, I'll call that uh, IA. And uh, the second will be this one. Okay. I'll just define it like this. And uh, this uh, will be called IB. Now I will use the heads here because we uh, will uh, use uh, complex numbers here. This is an arbitrary definition. I could uh, use uh, a different uh, direction. But you will see that uh, if I define it like this, uh, the two meshes will actually be independent. And uh, I will have uh, two equations, but it will not be a set of two equations with two unknowns. So let's start with IA. Uh, we know that uh, we need to start from some node, follow this uh, mesh, and uh, this mesh needs to be closed. So I'm starting at this node, we put it in, in red, I'm starting at this node here, and uh, I'm following the mesh and I end at the same node again. And in the mesh we are summing the voltages. So I will sum the voltage here on uh, the inductor L1 and on the resistor. Plus of course the voltage V1. So the first equation for IA will look like this. We have uh, the current that I'm saying it's IA. So current IA at times inductive reactance of uh, the inductors times XL1 at plus the voltage on uh, resistor R1, which will be IA at times uh, R1. And now 
if I follow this mesh, I'm going against my chosen direction of V1, so minus V1 hat, and this sum is equal to zero. So this is my equation for IA. For IB, it would look very similar. I start here, I have first R2, so it will be IB hat times R times R2 plus IB hat times uh, XL2 hat and uh, minus V1 hat and this equals to zero. So we can see that uh, now we have two equations with two unknowns but it's not a set. Uh, from this first equation I can calculate IA and from this equation I can calculate IB. Now what if I want to calculate this VAB? Well it's very simple. <coughs> if I choose, uh, uh, it, it's the difference in voltages between this node and between this node. So uh, it will be, uh, for example, if I define that this is my reference node, then uh, I see that it's the voltage that I have on resistor R1, it's this voltage, and uh, this voltage as well. So it's the voltage difference between those two. So uh, I can uh, calculate what is my voltage here on node number A, like that. So let's call it VA hat. That will be given by uh, IA times uh, R1. So I A, which I already have from my, my equation, times R1. Then VB hat will be the voltage here on node number 3, uh, which is nothing else than uh, IB hat. Uh, times XL2 uh, and uh, my result is that it's VAB it's obviously this minus this so it will be IA at uh, times uh, R1 minus IB at times XL2 at, I forgot here the heads so this would be my result, and uh, if I have uh, the uh, the given values of my components, I can calculate the currents, and I I can calculate the voltages. So this method is fairly straightforward. Now let's analyze the circuit again with uh, the node method. So I'll just erase all this. And uh, we'll start from a blank circuit again. So, uh, for the node method, we are calculating the voltages at individual nodes. We already know that we need two equations. And for what nodes will those equations be? Now, I need to select what is the reference node. So it's always a good idea to select that the reference node is uh, one pole of uh, my power supply voltage. So uh, I select, for example, this, this node to be my reference. Now, again, let me remind you that a node is not just this dot, that a node is all this, all this connection is one node number four, all this connection is node number one. And uh, we need to write two equations. I can see that I don't need to write the equation for node number one, because now node number four is my reference, and this is my given voltage, V1. So I know what is the voltage on node number one. So I will write the equations only for node number two and for node number three. So let's do it. Uh, for the node method, we are summing the currents. So we take one node, we say that the sum 
of uh, the currents in the node is equal to zero where uh, let's not call this uh, let's not call this i but let's call this n equals to zero and n is going from one node to the, the number of nodes which would be some capital n for example uh, so we're summing the currents <clears throat> so we'll write one equation for node number two and uh, one equation for node number three so here are my chosen directions of currents I have chosen that the current will be one like that the other one be, will be like that I always like to choose uh, the current directions out of the nodes so that I have uh, not a problem with the signs in my equation and I will define that if the current is going out from the node it will have a positive sign so now I'm calculating the voltage VA since I have chosen this direction my assumption is that VA is larger than V1 at the end we'll see that this is not true so the real direction of the current will go like that but uh, that's not a problem we will just have a negative sign in our current in the result so current through an inductor it will depend on the voltage difference on the inductor so the voltage difference is uh, the voltage at this node minus the voltage at that node so VA hat minus V1 hat that's my voltage on the inductor divided by XL1 hat that's this current then I have the second current in my node which is through R1 and uh, this is given by the voltage VA hat and uh, the voltage on node number four that's my reference so it's zero so it's minus zero here divided by r1 and this is this current of this current but this current going through r1 and the sum is zero now we can see that uh, this will give us uh, um, the value of VA if we calculate that so from this equation uh, we are able to calculate what is VA how much is it it's something it will be a complex number and the second equation uh, will be for node number three we're calculating uh, the voltage on node uh, the voltage VB so I start with R2 so it's gonna be VB hat minus V1 hat divided by R2 plus VB hat divided by XL2 hat and this is equal to zero and again from this equation you're gonna get uh, VB equals to something and then uh, you can again uh, say okay I'm looking for VAB so it's going to be VA minus VB uh, okay so that's an example of uh, how to solve uh, our circuit uh, I will show you a few more examples how this calculation will be done so I'll just switch back uh, to my presentation here uh, you see the uh, resulting uh, calculation if uh, you substitute uh, the actual numbers in there so uh, this is the inductive reactance for my inductors uh, this is the equation that I uh, need to solve and uh, here we can see the resulting uh, values of my voltages so the first line is uh, the algebraic form and uh, the second line is uh, the exponential form they are both equivalent but uh, 
I'm showing here both uh, ways so that uh, you understand that both are possible. So for example, this voltage V24, that's uh, the voltage on node uh, number 2 with respect to node number 4, which was my reference. Uh, then it, the real part of the voltage is 90 and the imaginary part is uh, minus 28.6. All this is in volts. So at the end, if we want to calculate the value of VAB, which is here, the voltage, then uh, we will just uh, subtract those two voltages and we'll get this in the, in the uh, algebraic form or we will get this in the exponential form. The last part that uh, we typically do for the AC circuit analysis is to plot a so-called phasor diagram. And the phasor diagram is a graphical representation of uh, voltages and uh, currents that we have in the circuit. Uh, we typically do not draw it in an exact scale, but we draw just the idea of uh, the behavior of the circuit. Although you could, of course, select a proper scale for voltage and for currents. But anyway, in our calculation examples, we'll just be interested in the shape, but we'll not be interested in the actual scale of our phasor diagram. So how does it work? Uh, we are in the complex domain, and uh, the phasor diagram is the representation of voltages and currents as frozen at some instant of time. So what we see in the phasor diagram is at one time instant. Now our time is advancing with that, with the angular velocity. And uh, we have said that uh, the positive direction is counterclockwise and the negative direction is clockwise. Let's plot the phasor diagram for this circuit. We start always with uh, some value that uh, we know from the circuit, something that we have defined. So let's assume that we know or that we have calculated, for example, the current that is going through my resistor R1. So I am choosing what is the direction and what is the size of, I, of uh, R1. The size is based on the scale that uh, I have chosen for currents. So this is my current IR1. That's the current flowing through the resistor. Now in the last lecture, last week, we have seen that if we have a resistor, the phase shift between voltage and current is zero. So if this is my chosen direction of IR1, then it means that uh, the voltage on this resistor will have exactly the same direction. So here you can see, okay, this is my current and this is my voltage, VR1. It has a different scale because uh, it is multiplied, uh, well, V equals uh, R times I. So uh, this is uh, my chosen scale for my voltage. And it has the same direction as IR2. Now, by looking on the circuit here, I know that the uh, current that is going through R1 needs to be the same like the current that is going through my inductor. Because those two components are in series. So I know that IL here, the current in the inductor, is exactly the same as uh, my current in resistor R1. The voltage on an inductor has a phase shift of 90 degrees compared 
to the current and it is a phase shift of uh, plus 90 degrees plus means in this direction so this is like that so if this is my direction of current through the inductor then this needs to be the voltage on my inductor L1 so voltage VL1 on my inductor and uh, voltage on my resistor now again by looking on the circuit we know that this voltage plus this voltage needs to give me the voltage that I have on my power supply V1 and remember that now we have two phasers we have one phaser for the voltage VR1 and the other phaser is uh, the voltage VL1 so we make a sum and this is a vector sum and this would be my power supply voltage V1 and we do the same approach for my resistor here at R2 and uh, L2 and uh, at the end we get uh, another phaser which will be here this, this voltage V1 and uh, we can find out that my voltage that I am trying to find out VA here and V B here I'm looking for VAB is the voltage difference between this node and this node and uh, at the end it's going to be this voltage like that so we can read also the direction and we can read the magnitude of my voltage from the phasor diagram now in the classes uh, you will be given more examples uh, to analyze the circuits uh, you will also compare the simulation with uh, this handmade calculation you will see that uh, it will give you uh, the same results uh, for voltage for, for everything for voltages currents um, phase shifts and, and so on so let me show you now uh, one more uh, example with a different circuit and uh, we'll again use both methods to analyze the circuit so we have three capacitors connected like that and uh, we have a resistor here and we want to calculate what is the voltage V2 we know the values of our components we know that uh, this voltage is given it's, uh, in my case I've chosen 200 volts 50 hertz frequency so let's uh, take this circuit and uh, let's uh, analyze it so I'll just uh, erase everything and uh, start uh, doing my calculations here and just move it a little bit like that so first of all let us analyze the number of equations so for the note method I have one two three uh, sorry um, not components I need to calculate the notes so I have three notes my equation three notes minus uh, number of voltage sources which is one minus one for the reference node so this would give me one equation for the mesh method <coughs> i have uh, one two three four five components minus three nodes minus zero current sources plus one so uh, 5 minus 3 it's 2 plus 1 is 3 so we can see that here there will be a significant difference in how many equations do we need to solve so for the mesh method we would need to solve three equations but for the node method there will be only one equation so I will start the analysis with the node method and then just at the end I'm going to show you how to write the equations for the method for the mesh method so one one uh, no, sorry uh, one equation is uh, necessary 
Now if we look uh, on our circuit, uh, we need to define the reference node. So I'm going to define that this will be my reference node. It means that I need to calculate uh, my voltage only on node number two, because on node number one it is already given. I need to define my direction of current, so let's define it like that. One current like this, or one current like that, like this, and like this. So I have a current through C1, through C2, C3, and R. And uh, the sum of uh, I, our currents is zero in the node. So, third current in the C1. It's the voltage difference on my capacitor. So this voltage is called V2, so it's going to be V2 hat minus V1 hat divided by XC1 hat plus <coughs> C2. Uh, we have V2 hat divided by XC2 hat plus V2 hat divided by xc3 hat plus v2 hat divided by r2 and this is equal to zero like that and from this we will be able to calculate that v2 is something now if for example i would like to calculate what is uh, this current going through my resistor IR I use Ohm's law so uh, IR hat is uh, V2 V2 hat divided by R and this would give me some value it will be a complex number so both V2 and uh, IR uh, will have some real component and some imaginary component. I could write that also in the exponential form, so some magnitude times uh, e to the power of j phi. So we can see that the node method in this example is fairly simple. Now let's take a look on the phasor diagram. And if I want to plot the phasor diagram and I don't care about the actual scales, I just want to see the, uh, the uh, shape of it, I can do it very simply. I need to start with some value that I have uh, in my circuit. So at the end now we have calculated what is the value of IR. So let's start from this. We'll draw the complex plane, so this will be real and this will be imaginary. Or well, maybe I'll just uh, try to make it look like a line, like that. It's going to be better. Nope. Real and uh, imaginary. And I'm going to choose the size and direction of uh, IR. Let's. Um, plot that in green for example. So I will choose that this will be I R hat. I have chosen that this is in the direction of the real axis. Now we have the current in my resistor. We know that the voltage is uh, in the same direction like my current because there is no phase shift between voltage and current. So it will be in this direction like that. This will be VR, which is nothing else than, a, than V2 like that. The scale is different because I need to choose some scale for the voltage. Now we have V2. Here we have our capacitor C3 and C2. It is connected to V2, this is V2, but for a capacitor we know that the phase shift is 
minus 90 degrees so uh, there will be first uh, the current and then there will be the voltage in other words the current is first charging the capacitor and the voltage is following so uh, the voltage on uh, sorry the current on the capacitor will be here so this is my current through IC3 and uh, here we'll have the current in C2 um, now without uh, looking at the values of my components uh, I will choose some size of uh, my current for, for C2 and for C3 uh, so IC3 is for example with this size uh, we know that uh, at the end we're gonna be looking for the sum of uh, those currents so I will just plot that this is uh, the value of uh, I C2 at so um, I've chosen a similar size of this current and uh, now I can make a sum we know that the current through capacitor C1 needs to be the sum of currents through C2, C3 and R. So we're going to make a, a vector sum here of uh, all the currents. So for, you see that I have already started the C2 at this point so that I can do this. I can do the sum of, uh, of my currents. So this is going to be my current. This is the sum of current in the resistor, capacitor C3 and capacitor C2. So I'm just going to call that I hat. And uh, now we know that this current I is going in the capacitor C1. And we know that uh, between the current and the voltage, we need to have 90 degrees phase shift. Or minus 90 degrees so um, it's gonna it's, since this is my positive direction like that and this is the direction of Omega then the voltage on my capacitor C1 needs to go in this direction like this so uh, this uh, is uh, my voltage VC1 hat and this is 90 degrees and now we have the voltage on C1 and the voltage on V2 and V1 has to be the vector sum of this voltage plus that voltage. So I'm here I have V2, Vc1, so I'm going to make a vector sum like that. And uh, it's going to be here, so let's make it uh, in red for example. and we know that this has to be my voltage V1 hat. So this is an approach how you can plot the phasor diagram. Of course you can do it in scale if you select for example that 1 ampere is 1 millimeter and 1 volt is 1 millimeter as well. You will have it in scale and uh, you can solve your circuit in a, a graphical way. Now let's try to solve this circuit uh, with the mesh method. I will see that it's going to be much more complicated, so we'll just write the equations for that. Now we've seen that uh, we need to write three equations, and I need to select three meshes. The mesh needs to be closed. So um, I will select one mesh, for example, like this. I will call that IA. Then I will select uh, one mesh, for example, like that. And uh, let's call this IB. And uh, the third one will be like that. And uh, I'll call that IC. Now, of course, all this will be complex numbers, so we should not forget uh, the, the hats in our equations. 
and let's write the e equation. So IA voltage on capacitor C1 plus voltage on capacitor C2 minus voltage V1. So uh, this voltage on the capacitor is given by the current times capacitive reactance. So uh, it will be IA hat times XC1 hat plus IA and now look on my chosen direction. IA is going like this and IB is going like that. So it's going to be IA hat minus IB hat times XC2 hat minus V1 hat equals to zero. So this is my equation for IA. Now IB mesh starts at this node. I'm going to write it in blue. So uh, here we will have uh, current IB hat. It's going like that, uh, clockwise, and this is going uh, counterclockwise. Yes. And uh, here uh, we'll have the minus sign, so that will be minus IB hat. Sorry, not, not B, but A. IA times X. Uh, oh, I need to write it in blue. Uh, times XC2 hat. Uh, and uh, here uh, in C3, I have uh, the uh, the current uh, IB and IC, so it's going to be plus IB minus IC at times uh, times uh, XC3 uh, at and equals to zero. And uh, the final equation for IC. Uh, start here, so it's going to be IC hat minus IB hat times uh, XC3 hat uh, plus uh, IC hat times R equals to zero. So now we have a set of three equations with three unknowns and uh, we'll be able to calculate IA IB and IC. So we can see that uh, it is quite important to select uh, a proper method at the very beginning because uh, this set of three equations with three unknowns will definitely be a lot harder to solve by hand compared to the one equation that we had in the note method. Okay, so uh, let's see uh, the result. Uh, here I have again pre-calculated uh, the values that uh, we will obtain from our circuit. Uh, I have obviously used the uh, note method since uh, it's giving me only one equation which is shown here. And uh, here in this equation, I have already substituted uh, the values uh, that I know. So the voltage here, this is uh, V1, which was given. And uh, those are the reactances uh, of the capacitors. And this is the resistance R that I have here. Uh, so here you can see the typical problem uh, that um, is happening uh, for the exam, for example, uh, that you are able to get correctly this equation, but then you're not able to solve this equation because here you have complex number. So I really suggest you to train calculations with complex numbers, uh, otherwise um, you will not be able to get the calculation results correctly. If you solve this equation with any method, then you're going to get this result. The first line is the algebraic form and the, the second line is uh, the 
exponential form. And again, we've seen how to create the phasor diagram, so we can see it here. It's the same like uh, I had uh, in my uh, in my drawing. Uh, we can see that uh, this is my voltage V1 in this direction, and uh, here we have the currents in the capacitor and the capacitors and resistors and the, their sum. Uh, which is uh, here shown as uh, IC1. So uh, you will train uh, with a much more calculation examples uh, this AC circuit analysis on the lab classes. Uh, starting from next week, we have uh, devoted uh, entire two labs uh, just for this to uh, train and uh, calculation. Uh, of course, you can simulate uh, the circuit as well uh, which uh, you will be doing also in the lab. Uh, third calculation example and the last one for the lecture is uh, this type of circuit. We see that uh, we have three components inductor, resistor and capacitor. Now they are all connected in series and uh, we want to calculate the current I1 that is going uh, in uh, the circuit and eventually we want to calculate the voltage on the capacitor. We know what is the voltage, we know what is the frequency and we know the values of our components. So I'm just uh, copy this back again to my uh, to my drawing board uh, and uh, will be writing directly in here. So first of all let's analyze the number of equations. So for the note method uh, I have four nodes in my circuit so it's going to be four minus the number of voltage sources which I have one minus uh, the one for the reference node so this is giving me two equations. For the uh, mesh method we need the number of components which is uh, one, two, three, four. So four components minus four nodes plus uh, so minus zero because we have zero current sources plus one and this will give me one equation. So I can see that uh, for the note method I need two equations, but uh, for the mesh method I need only one. So I will use the mesh method to write this equation and to solve my circuit. Now I have already defined the mesh here. You don't have a choice how you can define the mesh. It's like that. Uh, don't forget that the mesh needs to be closed and we are summing the voltages. So the voltage on inductor plus voltage on resistor plus voltage on capacitor minus V1 equals to zero. So let's do it. Uh, let's use I1 times XL plus I1 times R plus I1 times uh, XC1 and this is uh, now I forgot the voltage so minus V1 hat and this equals to 0. So from this we'll get the value of uh, I1 will be something. Now if I want to calculate what is the voltage on my capacitor then I can use Ohm's law so VC uh, will be at the current I1 times XC1 hat. Oh, I forgot the hat here. So this will give me some value of LVC. Again, we'll see in a minute the specific values of the current and the voltage that I have pre calculated. So now uh, let's uh, talk about the phase diagram. So we'll plot it like this. 
so this will be real access this will be the imaginary access uh, I need to select uh, some direction so I'll select that uh, this is my chosen direction of uh, I1 like that Omega is going like this and uh, now let's start with the inductor in an inductor we have uh, a phase shift of uh, 90 degrees and uh, the voltage is uh, first so 90 degrees in the positive direction means that the voltage on the inductor will be like this so this is V L hat then we have a resistor it's uh, going to be in the same direction like I1 so for example it's going to be like this so this is going to be not I but uh, VR and uh, the voltage on the capacitor will be like this so, so uh, let's uh, <coughs> see again this uh, this phasor diagram uh, here uh, we uh, have the voltage on the inductor here we have the voltage on the capacitor now I have chosen the, the sizes of my voltages without any respect to my values so uh, the final voltage will either be going upwards or downwards dependent on the relation between VL and VC which in turn uh, depends on the num on the size of the components like on their values so for my particular selection I have chosen that VC is slightly larger than VL here uh, therefore if I sum VL plus VC it will give me for example this voltage like that or well, not this well maybe a little bit smaller like this so this is VL plus VC and then I sum this voltage with VR which will give me this voltage so this is V1 hat in other words the direction of uh, my voltage in this circuit will depend on the values of components it can go like this the phase angle can be uh, can be negative uh, but if uh, the inductor will play a larger role it can simply be also like that so here it really depends on what scale do you choose for the voltages and what are the values of my components uh, let me very briefly show you how this circuit would be solved with uh, the um, node method so for the node method we've seen that uh, we need to write two equations I will select uh, this is my reference node I don't need to calculate node voltage number one because this is given by V1 and I will write one equation for node number two and one equation for node number three so let's do that uh, we will define the, the direction of uh, our currents so uh, let's define it like this this will be one current this will be another current and uh, then this will be another current going like this so this is node number three this is node number two so for node number two I have a current uh, in the inductor and current in the resistor now obviously they will be equal because the, this is connected in series so the, the current in the inductor is given by voltage V2 hat minus V1 hat which is on this node number one so V2 hat minus V1 hat divided by XL now I have chosen this orientation so that here I can have a plus sign 
and uh, this voltage on the resistor here we have V2 and here we have V3 so it's gonna be V2 hat minus V3 hat divided by R and this is equal to 0 so this is equation for node number 2 and for node number 3 uh, we have already this uh, current defined so uh, it's going into the node and therefore I'll use the minus sign so it's going to be minus V3 hat divided by XC plus uh, sorry that, that's, that's not correct here I made a mistake here so uh, here it's going to be V3 hat minus V2 hat divided by R plus uh, the, the value here for uh, the current in the capacitor which will be V3 hat divided by XC and this equals to zero. So from this set of two equations with two unknowns we will get V2 hat and V3 hat and this is equal to something. So again, I have uh, pre-calculated uh, what are the, the results for my uh, circuit. And uh, we can see here that um, this is my current in the exponential form, so 1.6 amperes. Uh, and here, this phase shift is in radians, so we can see what is the phase shift. And here we can see the final uh, phase diagram uh, with respect to the component values. So in my calculation, uh, the impact of uh, the capacity was larger. So in overall, uh, it is uh, acting like capacitive load. Um, so that's all for AC circuit analysis. Now in the remaining uh, time, we're going to discuss uh, electric power. And we'll start with RMS value. Now for most of you this is going to be just uh, repeating some known stuff. Uh, what is the RMS value? Now the RMS value of an AC voltage is defined as having the same thermal effects as the DC voltage with the same value. So for example if I have uh, voltage RMS uh, equal to let's say 100 volts for example this is flowing in a resistor of some value then it will dissipate some heat so there will be some power uh, not, not R but uh, but P here that is uh, given away as heat so the RMS value will be having the same effect as a DC voltage. So if my RMS value is 100 volts, then the same thermal effects will be as 100 volts DC. Now in this formula, you can see the general equation how to obtain an RMS value. RMS stands for root mean square. So uh, what you're doing is that you're taking your voltage as a function of time you're squaring that, you're calculating the integral, and then you're calculating the square root. In graphical terms, what does it mean? If I have an AC waveform like that, T, and this is my voltage, what this formula is doing is that it's basically calculating the area here and area there, but since you're squaring that, you, at the end, it, the sum will not be zero because uh, here, uh, if you would directly integrate that as a sine wave without the square here, you would get uh, positive and negative here, so, and the sum will be zero. So, uh, this is how you can calculate the RMS value for an arbitrary waveform. It does not have to be a sine wave. Now, if we substitute a sine wave, a sine wave is described as a magnitude times sine and omega is my angular frequency. So if you integrate this 
and you simplify the equation, you will find out that for sine wave, it is the magnitude divided by a square root of 2. But this is valid only if it's a sine wave. So this is where the square root of 2 factor is coming from. So if you have a sine wave like that, t and then v, here you have some v max, then uh, the RMS value is calculated by taking the v max and divided by square root of 2. But keep in mind that this is really only for a sine wave. If it's not a sine wave, then this factor would be something else. Something else. Let's take a look on electric power. Now what you see here in this chart is uh, voltage, current and power. Now the voltage shown here in red is sine wave, like this. The current is also a sine wave, but you can note that we have a phase shift between voltage and current. If um, we would have a resistive load, this phase shift would be zero. If we look now on this chart, we can find out what type of load this is. If we froze the time at, let's say, this time instant, we see the peak here of my voltage and it takes some time before I reach the peak of my current. So we have first voltage and then current. So this picture is definitely for an inductor. So this is an inductive load. And uh, we know that electric power, the instantaneous power, is uh, voltage times current. So at every instant I will multiply my voltage with current. So for example if I am at this point here I have this value of my voltage, I have uh, this value of my current and this number times this number will give me power. You can see that there are regions where we have uh, to multiply positive number with a positive number that's uh, for example for example here in this region here we have in this region we have positive voltage here and uh, we have positive current so we're multiplying positive by positive which gives us a positive result there are, however, regions where we are multiplying a positive number with a negative one. So, uh, for example, here we have positive voltage, but we have negative current. So the power will be negative. So we can see that the value of the instantaneous power can be positive and negative. This means that the power in an AC circuit can move back and forth between the power supply and the load. So it's not flowing only in one direction as uh, is the case of uh, the, uh, the DC circuit. Uh, in most cases we don't care that much about the instantaneous power. So we don't need to multiply the power at every time instant. But we are looking for the average power through the whole period of my signal and uh, we can derive mathematically that uh, the average power is given as the RMS voltage times RMS current times cosine phi and cosine phi is called the power factor and phi is the phase shift here so if we are in a circuit where we have only resistive load. For resistive load we know the, that the phase shift is um, 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So uh, for a resistive load this power factor will be equal to 1. 
for inductive load and capacitive it will be smaller than one so we can derive several types of uh, electric power if we are only in a DC circuit we take the voltage times current and the units of course is watts if we are in an AC circuit single phase now then we take the RMS voltage times RMS current times the power factor active power has units of watts but we have seen here that uh, also some part is moving back and forth and uh, this is called reactive power so a reactive power is power that uh, is present in capacitive and inductive circuits so it can be shown that reactive power is again RMS voltage times RMS current times the sine of my angle if we are in a resistive circuit phi is zero sine of zero is zero and reactive power for a resistive circuit will be zero units of reactive power are called volt ampere reactive we can calculate uh, also apparent power and the apparent power is uh, the vector sum of active power and reactive power so you can imagine this like a triangle where we have active power reactive power and the sum of this is the apparent power now the units of apparent power are volt ampere you can see the triangle here so uh, here P that's my active power Q that's my reactive power and uh, the apparent power is the vector sum of that so it's like a triangle and uh, the power factor is uh, related to this angle so if I have a resistive load then Q is 0 phi is 0 and uh, apparent power is equal to active power the last thing for today would be three-phase network and three-phase power now in a three-phase network we have three voltages with the same magnitude but uh, with a different phase shift so if you plot that as a function of time you will see three sine waves one like that that's, uh, that's, um, let's call that V1 for example V1 uh, then one has a phase shift of plus 180 degrees and the other one has a phase shift of minus 180 degrees so 9, 120 degrees uh, so this would be V uh, in my case this is V3 and uh, this is V2 so this is in the time domain we can plot this in the phasor diagram we just uh, plot uh, the three voltages as frozen in time so this is uh, voltage V1 you can see it has zero phase shift so that's why it's aligned with the real axis now V3 has a phase shift of 120 degrees plus so remember that omega is going like that this is plus omega so therefore V3 is oriented like this this is 120 degrees and V2 has minus 20 degrees so it's going like that and uh, this angle is uh, minus 120 degrees so how to use this if we want to calculate power uh, we again can calculate uh, active reactive or apparent power now uh, in a three-phase circuit it is the RMS voltage times the RMS current times the power factor and here we have times the square root of 3 
Uh, why is it square root of 3? You can see here the mathematical explanation. We are summing the voltages together. We need to use the cosine law, which you can see here. And uh, you can see, okay, now here I sum v squared plus v squared minus this. We, you get in the tables what is the value of cosine of 120. And at the end, you will find out that it's the RMS voltage times the square root of 3. So this is where the square root of 3 is coming from. Uh, for the reactive power, it's the same. So it's the square root of 3 times RMS voltage times RMS current times sine of my phase angle. Again, if I have a resistive load, then phi is 0 and therefore reactive power would be 0 as well. And the apparent power is the geometric sum of uh, active and reactive power. So again, we are back at this triangle uh, where we are summing uh, those, uh, those uh, powers in the triangle. Uh, last thing for today is uh, power factor compensation. Now we have seen that if I have an inductive or a capacitive load, we have some reactive power. It doesn't matter if I'm in a single phase or a three phase circuit, in uh, inductive or capacitive uh, loads, we always will have some reactive power. So what it means is that we're moving the energy back and forth between the power network and our load. The load can, for example, be an induction motor. We want to reduce the amount of power that is moving like this back and forth. So it means that we need to reduce the power factor. So let's imagine we have a generic load with some impedance Z. Now, uh, in most cases, this impedance will be an inductive load because uh, it's, it's quite common to have electric motors which are acting like inductors. So this is an inductive load. Now, if we plot an inductive load in a phasor diagram, we will first uh, see voltage and then current. And uh, if we want to compensate the effects of uh, this uh, inductive load, we need to connect in parallel to my inductor a capacitor. So let's see that in a phasor diagram. Just uh, put it here separately. So uh, initially we have inductive load, so here is uh, real and imaginary. Uh, let's say that this would be my uh, current. Oh, for example, no, not current but voltage. Let's say let's say this will be my voltage. And uh, if it's an inductive load, the current will be going like this. This is the current uh, through an inductive load. Now uh, I can uh, connect a capacitor in parallel to my inductive load. And for a capacitor, we know that the current will go like that. And if I choose a proper value of uh, the capacitor, I can achieve that uh, this current in the capacitor will have the same magnitude as the current in the inductor. So this is IL, this is IC. And therefore, the total current will have no imaginary component. It will, if it's well, it, if it's like a resistive load at the end, it's uh, it's going to be like that. So power factor compensation is how to connect the capacitor in parallel to my inductive load and what should be the value of my capacitor. Uh, if you want to do a full power factor compensation. This is the formula that allows you to calculate the capacitor value. So here you need the original power factor of your load. 
this is the power that uh, you have in the load and omega is the frequency v is voltage so if you have a total power compensation based on this equation then uh, you will be having zero reactive power at the end so there will be no uh, reactive power moving back and forth between your load and the power network but there will be a reactive power here of course moving between the inductor and capacitor now in most cases this formula if you want to do full power compensation will give you a quite large value of capacity so uh, in those cases uh, it would not be very practical to have like many many capacitors connected together so you probably will not do a full power factor compensation but you will compensate for example to 0 0.95 of power factor at the end and uh, this is where this comes in play uh, here I have my original voltage in my uh, capacitor uh, in my in, on my load this is uh, the original current that I had uh, in uh, the impedance without the capacitor now with the capacitor this is the current in the capacitor and uh, the sum is this current so you can see that I have reduced significantly the imaginary component here uh, this part of uh, that, that's the, what is doing me the reactive power in my circuit and if I would do full power compensation it means that the current at the end would be here like that this would be my current taken from the power network but um, in most cases this uh, would give me like a very large value of capacitor which would not be very practical uh, you will do more simulations and calculations also uh, on the lab classes uh, that you will have next week and in two weeks so that is all and uh, we'll see us next week.